Welcome to Baseball Biz. I'm Mark Carpenter, your host, and with me today, we have a very special guest, Mr. Nat Gordon of Boston Sport Talk. And Nat covers everything when it comes to Boston, but primarily today, we're going to be taking a look at what's going on with the Red Sox, some of the insights he can share with us, and taking a look at what's happening right now, because there's a lot going on. How are you doing today, Nat? Hey, man, I'm great. How about yourself? That's fantastic. Not getting much sleep, you know, brother. There's so much going on right now with a lot of people moving from here to there, a lot of free agents. It seems like there's a very tight time frame to get a lot of these deals done. Yeah, it really feels like you close your eyes for two seconds and then you're getting the Jeff Pass notifications. It's crazy. I, it's been an unprecedented time in baseball. You've never seen deals like this coming together so early and so fast. It really makes you think about, you know, how a deadline for these types of deals could work in the future. I know the players have been reluctant to have it, but I mean, it's been great for the game. I know we're approaching a time where, you know, we may, we'll have the lockout and it's going to be a lot of questions and, you know, a lot of upset fans, but right now it's fun. That's right. That's right. Right now it's fun. So we'll see how that goes because today is November 30th on Tuesday. And man, those agents, those teams, those players, they're moving quickly. I, I, I got to tell you that when all this started, I was thinking, are players going to feel a need to go ahead and maybe undervalue themselves to get a contract done? That doesn't seem to be the case. Well, look, well let's take a look. I mean, you look at Max Scherzer. <laughs> and here's a guy, he, you know, late in the season, say, my arm is dead. You know, postseason. It's, it's, uh, this guy, I mean, he has the tenacity and will stay out there for anything. But when he was saying something like that, I thought, your stock value just went down significantly. I was wrong. <laughs> Here's a guy that I thought, you know, coming from, uh, I thought he would stay with the Dodgers. Uh, a year ago, whatever was it, see, when they were going to trade him, he had some say about where he was going to go. And he said, you know, West Coast looks good. So the, the Dodgers picked him up. I thought, hey, you got to love it out there. It's the Dodgers. They'll spend some money on you. But no, that all changed. And thanks, I guess, to Steve Cohen, who's really trying to build a team again. Yeah, he's really trying to change the the perception of what it what it means to play for the Mets. You have a guy like Max Scherzer come choose to play for you guys. That's that's a big deal. Uh, money talks. That's if we if we know one thing and we we continue to learn it once again. Money talks and getting forty three million dollars a year. Oof. You'll go, you'll go to play for the Mets, even if you, your preference was to play on the West Coast. $43 million in three years of it talks. Yeah, that, that's more than lunch money. So he's definitely going to be doing well with that. There's a lot to talk about, whether it be the CBA and such. But I want to come back into your realm and into that world you know better than just about anybody. And that's the Boston Red Sox. Man, I, I can tell you from a couple of years ago, being also a Tampa Bay Ray, Rays fan, I was sad to see. Heim Bloom leave. But I thought, what's going to happen once that man gets to Boston? The first thing I see is, oh my gosh, Mookie Betts, really? You're, 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 you're giving up Mookie Betts? What, what's, what's that about? How did you and the rest of the fans feel early on about this guy who's going to be making those kind of decisions for the Red Sox? Well, the public perception around Heim Bloom here early on was not great. And honestly, to this point, even despite the success, it's still. I think a lot of fans don't like the way he operates, but the fact of the matter is, as you as a Rays fan have seen, it works. As we have Red Sox fans have seen, he put a good team together on the field last year to take him from a last place team to just two wins away from the World Series. The man knows what he's doing, and he may not operate in a way that's fun for us in the offseason. You know, Red Sox fans, we are all used to winning the offseason, and making big trades and big free agent signings. I'm sure you remember when we paid what it was like $140 million, something like that for Carl Crawford. And a lot of those signings have not panned out the way we would have liked. So we're used to winning the off season and stuff like that. It's not like that right now in Boston. Heim Bloom, this is his third year and he's still yet to hand out a contract longer than two years, which Boston fans are not used to that, so there's a lot of frustration. But I've been trying to preach this to everyone. I'm trying to preach it to myself because I'm I'm getting frustrated too. But you got to preach patience because we're early on in the off season. 
this is the first year in which Heim Bloom has the base of a team that could win. He coming in in 2019, going into 2020, his objective was to cut costs. Going into 2021, it was to take a last place team and make them at least somewhat watchable. That's not really a situation where you're going to spend a ton of money. Going into this year, it's a little bit different. You're a couple wins away from the World Series. You've got the base of a good team, but we've never really seen what Heim Bloom can do with a team like that that's close to winning a title, yet have that money to spend. We don't know if he's going to be willing to spend it now. We don't know if he's ever going to be willing to spend it, whether that's on him or whether it's on ownership, uh, who just made a large investment themselves, buying the Pittsburgh Penguins for over $900 million. There's so much unknown, and we're just we're learning more and more every day. But the more we learn, the more we realize we don't know. I am blue. My gosh, man! I, I, again, I, I didn't know how that was going to work out. It seems like some things are happening. The short-term contracts, yeah, that's something that may be more of a trend. We we look for legacy players. We look for somebody that is the face and identity of a team that we expect to see for years. With Heim Bloom. And he's not unique in this. I think there's a lot of teams that have moved more and more to thinking short number of years for a, a player. They're they're not looking at saying, oh, I want somebody's face on the outside of the building that will be there for five or ten years. They're, they're thinking maybe more like two or three. If you think you have a rich farm system, you'll be able to, to save money in those three or four years. You're going to have people coming up. But hey, anyway, what's your feeling about that? I feel like Heim Bloom wants to operate this team like the Los Angeles Dodgers. And I think the Dodgers philosophy is you find that one player, that those couple of guys that you're willing to invest in ultra long term. But outside of that, you're willing to pay, but you're willing, you want to keep things short so you can keep that financial flexibility long term. Keep the farm system stocked so you can you can trade for guys with shorter years remaining on the deal you're not heartbroken if they leave yeah. because you're always going to replenish but the guy i keep looking at as like teams trying to keep contracts off uh, what i'm trying to say is in three years juan soto is going to become a free agent and i think that you'll see teams willing to invest more money to keep contracts at three years or less to try to make a run at him in three years i think that's Part of why the Mets were hell bent on three years for Scherzer instead of going up to a fourth. And I think that's going to be Hein Bloom's philosophy. He's going to wait and see when that one guy he wants to invest in becomes available and he'll pounce on that. That sounds like what we're going to see from his strategy. I, I, I want to remind folks we're talking with Nat Gordon from uh, Boston Sports Talk and taking a look. I want, I want to go more about what's happening today with the Boston Red Sox. Glad you spent some time on that. And, and I'll mention, too, if you look at what Nat has online on TikTok, you, you had some interesting thoughts about Javi Baez and also on uh, Correa. We'll, we'll get into those in a minute. But if, if we're looking right now, I say, what, 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 what is happening with that team? You know, what is happening with the Red Sox? You know, you got Kyle Schwarber, free agency. You know, Robles, free agency. Santana, free agency. Uh, Adovino, you know, all these guys. And then Erod. Eduardo Rodriguez. Wow. That was a big slap in the face to me when I was looking at what that team would look like. Yeah. And, and replacing Eduardo Rodriguez has to be priority number one for them. They've preached patience like they always have. It's a methodical approach. And I think it's going to be an approach that may take us in. And, and I'm going to say this and you're going to release this and then they're going to make some crazy move and it's going to make me look like an idiot, but I think they're going to take this into the lockout and beyond, at least with the majority of what they have to do. I think they're going to use the lockout as a strategy. Say the lockout ends in mid February and these guys are going to have to be finding homes within weeks to get to spring training on time, particularly pitchers who need to get there obviously earlier. I could totally see the Red Sox standing pat and trying to, scrape and claw for some cheaper deals after the lockout ends. Again, it's a, it's an approach that's going to frustrate fans who are seeing, you know, the Texas Rangers invest hundreds of millions of dollars. The Mets go out and get four premier free agents. And 
you see a team that was just two wins away from the World Series seemingly not doing anything. When it's all said and done, that's not going to be the case. They're not going to have done nothing, and they're not going to let Rodriguez walk to the Tigers without replacing him with an option they think can be just as good, if not better. But it's going to come on their terms. It's going to come on their time. They're going to pay. They're not going to overpay. They're going to pay what they see as value for a guy that they think can outperform the financial commitment they're going to make in him. And generally, those deals don't tend to come until later on in the offseason. I think it's going to be frustrating, but I think they're going to get there. I think that's sound advice. One thing to realize, too, as Nat and I are talking, it is, again, I'm going to say November 30th, and anything that happens after this, we're not responsible for. So <laughs> we, we, won't, we won't hold you or I accountable to anything after this hour because the world is changing. And you're talking about those players who may be hanging out to the, to the end. I mean, almost a spring train. We look a few years back and Bryce Harper is like, is he actually going to sign somewhere? He and Machado both that year. It was like a race to see who would be the last one to, to, to have an agreement with someone. I don't know. I mean, maybe we'll see some of that this year. I, I, I think the CBA is going to blow up everything as far as it has already. Like I said, I was concerned that we would see players who were going to diminish their value, but it, that doesn't seem to be the case. And so, so we'll see. Um, we were looking earlier at the Red Sox and what you had to say about Javi Baez, which I found very interesting. And it's, it's not a dated piece as far as I would say. So, folks, again, we're talking to Nat at Boston Sports Talk. And on there, you've got a few comments, what you had to say about Javi Baez. Could you share some of that with our folks today? Yeah, I've never been a big Javi Baez fan. You're looking at a guy who obviously plays – premier defense and he's got great pop and that's great but you're gonna get a guy who's gonna lead the league in strikeouts that's what he did last year a low on base guy for a team and like if you get Baez one thing I was saying in my video is if you get Baez you're more than likely replacing Kyle Schwarber with him Schwarber came in last year as a left-handed high on base bat and it changed the Red Sox lineup when, when they acquired Schwarber, he was injured and he wasn't able to come back for, I believe, it was either 10 or 12 games. And they were either 2-8 and eight or 2-10 and 10 in that stretch. And Schwarber came into the lineup as a left-handed high on base bat with Pop, and he changed the entire dynamic of the lineup. You replace that with Baez, who is yet another right-handed hitter, high strikeout guy, low on base. I just didn't see the fit. Obviously, defensively, he would improve the Red Sox infield defense, which was the worst in baseball last year. But uh, we just saw this morning that he signed that six-year, $140 million deal with the Detroit Tigers. I was pretty happy to see that the Red Sox did not give him that money. <laughs> I have fans of other teams, including the Mets, where he came from, that were also happy that they didn't give him that kind of money. So I, I guess I'm happy to have that weight off, the, off my shoulders because the Red Sox were mentioned as interested in Baez all throughout the offseason. And as I said before, we really have no idea how they were truly going to operate. So you never knew if that was going to be the guy that they pounced on. I'm just glad it wasn't. And, and I don't know about you. I was I was a little bit surprised about the Tigers picking up Schwarber because Correa was having a long breakfast slash lunch with, with A.J. Hinch from the Tigers, uh, I think, last week. And a lot of people say, I wonder if he'll be there with his old coach. Will he be joining him again? And See, Correa's still out there now. So Correa wasn't it, and Bias came in. I wonder where he'll wind up. Yeah, it's it's crazy. The market seems to be shrinking for Correa. But one team that I just – and I haven't really heard them mentioned yet, but I just wouldn't surprise me would be the Los Angeles Dodgers. You just saw them yesterday lose out on Max Scherzer, who I'm sure they came into the offseason expecting to be able to retain. They lost Corey Seager, who – I didn't think they were going to retain, but still, that's a that's a large investment that they didn't make, and they they now have an, a middle infield spot that they could fill, and money to spend, as we know with the Los Angeles Dodgers. So I just I wouldn't be surprised if they went all in on the twenty seven year old free agent. Yeah, I'm really curious to see that too. I mean, Seager, what he left and went to the Texas Rangers, and the Texas Rangers and the Tigers and the Mets, they're spending ungodly amount of money compared to what I would have thought they would. And they brought on Seager what was for 10 years and $325 million a contract. Whoa. Yeah. I mean, 
<laughs> to have 10 years with anybody with the expectations of having any kind of health, you know, that's, that's amazing to me. So God bless him and wish him the way, the best, but I, I do, I too want to see what the Dodgers are going to do stepping up to that. Let's see my brother. What else we got here? Oh, I know what I want to talk to you about. Let's see. Uh, some of my favorite Boston Red Sox players are former Rays. Nate Diovaldi, for instance. Man, it is a joy. I don't care if being a Rays fan or not. I enjoy watching that man pitch, even if it's against us, because it is amazing what he's able to bring to that mound. It isn't always necessarily the success you want, but the amount of uh, pitch types that he can deliver is amazing. And any batter that thinks they know what's going to come, it's a mistake. Yeah, he's got he's got five pitches that he can throw consistently for strikes. Throws them all over ten percent of the time, which is something you just don't see, particularly in in today's game. You know, you don't have starting pitchers who can throw five pitches like that. And he's been much better than expected for the Red Sox. They signed him to, I believe it was like a four year, sixty something million dollar contract back after the 2018 World Series, and everyone, including myself, called it a reactionary signing uh, because he played such a hero's role in that World Series. You know, a guy who hasn't historically stayed healthy. But since he signed that contract, he's he's been healthy. He's been great. He finished top five in the Cy Young Award award voting this year, which is a huge accomplishment for him. Uh, Really, really happy for him putting that year together. He was nails in the postseason, not just in 18, but this year as well. He's he's turning himself into a into a cornerstone here in Boston, and his contract is coming up to an end after this coming year. And I don't think that a lot of people expected when he signed this contract that he would be here beyond it. But I, he would be really really tough to replace. It, it's going to be something they're going to have to think about. I know there's other extensions that the Red Sox need to worry about as well with Rafi Devers and Xander Bogarts, but Nathan Evaldi's contract is going to need to be talked about too. Yeah, I mean, with when he keeps continuing to deliver those results, I would think so. I don't know that I'm will give you more than a couple of years at a time, but I, I look forward to seeing that too. Rafael Devers, oh my gosh, man, that guy, he stuns me. How amazing he can move out there, you know, in the infield, getting in and getting balls over to first and just at the bat. And as exciting as he is, I have a difficult time watching him. I'll be honest with you, with a big old piece of char in his mouth or whatever. Oh, not yet. <laughs> but but what a great player! What a great player you guys have there. Yeah, no, he's terrific, and he's he's a, certainly a fan favorite around these parts. Everyone, the report came out yesterday from Chris Catillo that the that the Sox endeavors have made quote zero progress on a contract extension. So a lot of people. Are, are frustrated at that just to add on to the frustration, but he is a terrific player to watch. He has so much fun on the field. He hits for power. His plate discipline is night and day from when he was a rookie. He's just a completely different player. His defense is steadily improving. He's got a great arm. He's got range. It's weird because like oftentimes these guys who don't rank well in the metrics defensively because they can't, they don't have any range and, and they just can't get to as many balls as you know some of these guys like Nolan Arenado can. But Rafi Devers has good range. He's got a good arm. It's just those routine plays he sometimes can't he can't get, and that kills him. But that's something that'll be improved. Um, something that's kept him at third base is his is his range. So you got to hope that you know a couple spring trainings of work can get that defense up to par where it needs to be. And I'm sure, especially if he doesn't get a contract extension done soon. Entering a free agent year, not this year, but next year, I bet he has a great defensive a defensive rise over the next couple of years because that's sort of been the one thing I think that's holding extension talks back is whether he's going to be a third baseman long term. I know he wants to be, and I think he he should and will be because I think the defense will come will come around. But I think that's a big piece of what's holding it back because obviously a third baseman who can play defense is going to get paid a lot more than a guy who you're going to hide at first base or play at DH. We've seen time and time again, and you have, you had Nelson Cruz this year in Tampa Bay, who's been riding one year contracts for years because he doesn't play the field. Yeah. And, and the other part of that, I mean, being a DH, it does limit you, but the other part that Tampa was looking for with him 
is a leader, a veteran. And quickly, I'll say about Tampa, we've had veterans in there. I mean, Charlie Morton was kind of a, a veteran for a little bit with us. Rich Hill was a veteran who was in there with us. You, if you want to see who the oldest guys are in baseball, you can usually find one or two of them at the race. And they, they, they give a leadership. Somebody in the dugout, as much as more, they deliver at batter in the field. And I think that's true of Cruz. So we're going to see how that goes. And we, we're, we're bringing in Corey Kluber. <laughs> that there, there's another season individual. So there, there's a lot of value to those people. And we'll, we'll see how that does. But when I'm looking back again at the Red Sox, and I'm talking to you about Rays players that I love. And he was just with us for a short while. But Hunter Renfro. Whoa. Whoa. Who, who will do those sort of things out there in right field? I mean, with the, he was with us one year, and he leaped over a concrete embankment to catch a ball. And I'm like, good Lord, man, who are you? And how is your body still intact after some of that stuff? Wow. Yeah, he was, he was an unexpected spark this year. Signed for just, just over $3 million in the offseason. Uh, coming in to maybe just be a platoon guy, but showed pretty quickly that he was, he was going to be a lot more than that. 30 home runs, 30 home run season for Renfro was, was terrific. And t- today's the, the tender deadline. And I, I believe the Red Sox will tender him his seven and a half million dollar contract for next season uh, as he's under team control for a couple more years. He was great for, for the Red Sox and he did struggle in the postseason, but he, he certainly got them there. And times where JD Martinez struggled during the summer in the middle of the season, Renfro his bat was on fire. Yeah. And he would hit huge home runs and make bazooka throws, gunning guys down at third base and at home. It was crazy. It was it was certainly a fun season. He has a flair for the dramatic. It was a lot of fun with him this year. Well, I guess you, I'm glad you guys are enjoying him. I, I, I miss him. You know, he's one of those people. We've got some great outfielders, but I really enjoy watching Renfro. One thing, though, on Boston Sports Talk, you did – one where you were talking about rent for a while back, and this was about COVID and his, his, what he had to say about that. I was, I guess I missed that one. I, I missed what was actually happening. I knew there was some controversy about how some things were being dealt with, with COVID at the Red Sox. Can you tell us a little bit about Renfro's remarks and, and what came from some of that? Yeah. It's actually weird to me that this didn't become a bigger story at the time. Uh, but back when the Red Sox sort of in August, early September, we're dealing with COVID and, you know, it seemed like half the roster was going on that COVID IL for 10 plus days, getting testing positive with COVID. And it was really, really, it was taking a hit on the team. And Hunter Renfro went on WEI, our local radio station here in Boston, and told the hosts that, Major League Baseball had told the Red Sox to just stop testing and only, only, only place symptomatic players on the COVID IL. And if players were asymptomatic, whether or not they had COVID, it's sort of just a don't ask, don't tell type deal. And that's how you keep guys on the field. And that was crazy because Renfro then told them that the Red Sox said, absolutely not. No, we're going to, we're going to keep testing and try to protect our players, which I admire because I just, I think it's important to keep keep COVID away from as many Red Sox players as possible. You never know um, whether they're, whether whether vaccinated or not. You never know when it's going to hit one of these guys hard. And you know you want to keep them on the field. You want to keep them healthy, not just in the short term but the long term. So I think that obviously the Red Sox made the right call to continue testing and hope to protect those guys. But it, I'm surprised that it didn't become a bigger story that Major League Baseball allegedly told them to stop testing their players when they were having a COVID outbreak. That was crazy to me. Yeah. Well, like I said, looking back, I was a little ashamed that I didn't see more of that and say more about it because to me, player health, it should be the top consideration for any team, you know, one, just as you should, how you should treat people. And two, if you're looking at it just as an investment, come on people. And MLB wants to Let's take a step back and say, oh, you know, let's, well, well, we need to get the games going. Well, the games did go. It takes, it takes a certain amount of commitment, I think, which the Red Sox did with their players. So I was glad to hear you guys doing that. So, man, okay, here we are. 
CBA is coming up. You're looking at your team. What are the decisions? Who are the people at this point you say, I said, I want to have on my team? Well, I, I think their number one need, as much as we all want Kyle Schwarber back, and I think that's a need, their needs need to be in the starting rotation. Right now, as it stands, you've got Nathan Avaldi, Chris Sale, Nick Pivetta, and they just signed Michael Waka to a one-year $7 million contract. And my thoughts on that is maybe he piggybacks with Tanner Houck and they maybe flip-flop, you know, who starts, who comes in out of the pen for maybe a multi-inning uh, relief appearance. But that leaves an open spot in the rotation, the Eduardo Rodriguez void. They're, the starting pitchers are falling fast. And the report uh, out of ESPN yesterday was that they may – explore the trade market as opposed to dishing out money for a starting pitcher on the free agent market. I know there've been some reports connecting them to Marcus Stroman, but as it stands right now, I mentioned earlier, the Red Sox had the worst infield defense in baseball. Stroman's a heavy ground ball pitcher. The fit isn't necessarily there unless they were to make a play for a shortstop and push Sander Bogarts to second, but that's, that's obviously a stretch to to predict something like that. So their their need is in the starting rotation. It's something that I would expect to get done after the lockout, particularly since the trade market really hasn't taken off. Players are definitely in a rush to sign, but teams are not necessarily in a rush to trade because the money's already there. Yeah, yeah. Well, th- that makes sense. And with Waka, I can tell you, I had greater expectations of him when he came to the race and maybe you guys will get more out of him. I hope you will. I uh, saw so one thing where Waka was saying he's going to work hard to be part of that five man rotation with the Red Sox. And, and you know, any player worth their grit is going to do that anyway. So I, I hope you guys find something with him, but I, I still see, like you're saying a hole in there that you, you need to fill. I think Waka will st- step up, but like you're saying, he and Hawk may have to, uh, share responsibilities in some games, but wow. Yep. And obviously it depends on, on what he shows early. Uh, I know at the end of the season, he was feeling better. His body was feeling better and he changed his pitch repertoire and had a little bit more success. It's not something that I would confidently say is going to lead to a, a re breakout of sorts in 2022 for him, but it certainly played a role in why the Red Sox signed him. $7 million is more than twice what he made last year in Tampa. So you got to hope that there's something there that they see, you know, something they, they think they can improve because his ERA last year was right around five. Yeah, I'll tell you what. I mean, you're talking about who's left the race. and Just quickly, one that really bothered me was, how come we're not keeping Charlie Morton? <laughs> the Atlanta Braves certainly, you know, appreciate when, when he moved over there. and. He was with an old catcher friend of his, Darno, who had also been with the race for a bit. But it's it, it hurts to see some of those guys going, and you say, who are you going to bring in here? It, you, just, you just don't know. And by just not knowing, go back to the beginning of 2021 AL East. Uh, a lot of folks were looking at the Red Sox being in the basement with Orioles at the very beginning of the year. If I'd gone to Caesars and I put down some bets about how the Red Sox would have done, I would have I would have pulled in a lot of money, I believe, because you guys did spectacular, rising far above what the expectations were. Yeah, it's it was crazy. And they got the Red Sox got swept by the Orioles in that first that first series of the season. And people were ready to shut the door on the season right up right then and there. But you know, unexpected performances out of some guys like we were talking about, Hunter Renfro. Kike Hernandez, who they signed last year, was a terrific addition. Nick Pavetta, they traded for in the middle of the 2020 season, and he pitched very well for the Sox last year. Just a lot of guys coming up and performing above their expectations. They stayed fairly healthy, at, at least until the COVID outbreak started. They took care of business early on, and it allowed them to to slide a little bit at the end of the season, but then they... They picked it up when they needed to in the postseason. It was it was a really fun ride and a ride that really came close to a, at least a World Series appearance. Now I'm going to ask you for your seer, your your projections into the next year, into 2022. 
And what do you see happening in the AL East and with the, the Red Sox? I think every year we're going to go into the season and look at what moves were made in the offseason. I think a lot of people are going to see the Blue Jays sign Kevin Gosman and, and automatically you know, throw them atop their projections. But I always preach caution and say, even though you don't necessarily love what you see on paper, the Tampa Bay Rays will always be there. And they will always, they will always be fighting for that top of the division spot. It's crazy. You might see a fourth place finish for the Yankees this year, despite their, their payroll. It really could go any way. It obviously depends on what we see the rest of the off season. We really don't know what any of these teams are really going to look like. You know, the, the Blue Jays just lost Marcus Simeon, so you don't know how they're going to fill that hole. We don't know what the Red Sox are going to do in the rotation or at second base. Like, there's there's so much to, so much still yet to happen. It's hard to make a firm projection at this point, but I think it's going to be a competitive division. You're still going to have – this is my dog, Chester. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Chester. Um, <laughs> you're going to have four competitive teams this year, though. You can, you can you can bet the house on that. Yeah, I think so too. The AL East was is an, is always a, a very competitive year. I mean, excuse me, always a very competitive uh, division. But you know, it, it's gotten more interesting. Like you're saying, the the Blue Jays, Toronto, just really you know stepped up. But seeing Semyon and and um, Robbie Ray, Robbie Ray going to the Mariners, it's like whoa. Okay, <laughs> we'll see what comes. I guess Gaussman's going to have to step up quite a bit and fill uh, Ray's spot, but. I don't know, brother. I, I haven't got it. I certainly don't have it all fixed out. And to ask anybody what 2022 is going to be like is not fair. And I realize that because I don't think anybody would have said at the beginning of 2021 what the that the Red Sox would have done or even what the Braves would have done. And hey, let's just see if we have a season first, right? We don't we haven't we don't even have a CBA right now. Let's let's get these guys on the field. Thank you, thank you very much. And if we're going to take about take a look at who are still some free agents here. This, again, is Tuesday morning, November 30th, so who knows what it's going to be like in a sharp bit. But Carlos Correa, there he is. He's still out there. Freddie Freeman. Okay, come on, people. Why hasn't that extension or or not extension? Why hasn't some kind of agreement been done in Atlanta? Uh, Chris Bryant's out, still out there. Trevor Story, Nick Cassianos, Marcus Stroman. You were talking about him, I believe, earlier. And those those are some key folks out there as well. When we talk about Kyle Schwarber, Chris Taylor, Anthony Rizzo, and my favorite, Solaire. Yeah, Jorge Solaire was crazy. He was incredible. I he was one of I tried to to make some predictions for free agents at the beginning of the offseason, figure out uh, what I thought people would get in terms of money and years, and I could not put a finger on what I think he's gonna get. He could get anything from like a one year prove it prove that you can do it for a full season deal or you know, some teams could buy into the 40 home run potential that he has and that he's shown he has and give him like a three-year three year contract. It's it's so tough to say what, what he's going to get. And, you know, you just mentioned a ton of names. There's so much movement still yet to happen. And a lot of those guys are going to still be on the board all throughout the lockout. We've got a lot. Even though these last couple of days have been crazy, there's still a lot to come. Yes, indeed. This is Mark Carpenter with Baseball Biz, and I'm talking with Mr. Nat Gordon and of baseball not baseball <laughs> boston sports talk and that's t-o-k as, as in tiktok i, I want to ask you something else to, about your how you're putting information out there on tiktok i mean obviously i see you on twitter but how, how is that your chosen media to let folks know what's going on well twitter twitter is something that i have spent a lot of time on even before uh boston sports talk came to be so it was natural for me to just use that as a platform to quickly get information out there. And when I feel that I want to go into a little bit more depth, that's, that's when we, uh, that's when we go on TikTok and, and create videos there. And it's been a lot of fun for us uh, just because my buddy Chase and I were, we're really passionate about, about our teams here in Boston. So, you know, it's something that we invest a lot of our time into just have always, you know, spent a lot of time consuming content and it was honestly about time that uh, we started creating some some content for ourselves in in this regard and related to Boston sports he's got a pretty successful YouTube channel that's uh, chase chats 
Uh, for those of you who want to explore that, he makes football videos weekly on that. And that he's, he's pretty popular there. So this is more of just like a side hustle for him. But uh, I guess I guess I have a full time job, too. So it's, it's a side hustle for me as well. Um, but it's been a lot of fun for us. I'm glad to hear it, brother, because, I mean, to me, it's exciting to talk with folks like yourself, you know, people who've been immersed, especially like with their with a specific team who, who know what's going on and are willing to share those insights with others. I want to thank you today for joining us today on Baseball Biz. It's been great. You've given us some insights. I'm sorry I missed that whole thing on Renfro and COVID. So, folks, if you want to stay in tune about what's happening, again, you can find that at Boston Sport Talk, and that's on Twitter. And what is it again? Is it the same? What's the handle on uh, TikTok? So on TikTok, we're Boston Sports Talk. And on Twitter, we're actually Boston at Boston Sport Talk because – at Boston Sports Talk was taken by uh, an account who hasn't tweeted in years, but we couldn't get it. So we're we're at Boston Sport Talk on Twitter. At Boston Sport <laughs> Singular Talk. Okay, right. on Twitter. Okay, brother. Okay, well, again, thank you uh, again, Nat, for joining us today. And it's been fun having you here on Baseball Biz. Wish you and the Boston Red Sox the best, except when you're facing us. <laughs> and enjoy this season as we wait to see what happens with the collective bargaining agreement on the MLB and the Players Association. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, hopefully we get through this lockout nice and quickly and we can get back to enjoying the product on the field. Amen, brother. Again, thank you all for joining us here on Baseball Biz, and we'll be talking with you again real soon. Special thanks to X-Take RUX for the music rocking forward.